all I remember is he kept screaming the word attache. <laughs> Are you saying he didn't take that out of his attache? And we were all looking at each other. We're like, what the hell is an attache? You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a uh, hot mic, Sam. You can't say God. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bitch! How's it going, dude? I'm good, how are you? I am uh, stubbornly focused on getting this agenda knocked out today the way I would like to do it. I hope you're not in the mood to disagree with me. Ian, when was the last time I disagreed with you? You're actually quite agreeable. Quite agreeable. How, uh, I mean, how could I possibly? We had trouble coming up with any examples between the two of us on this, where we had to change each other's minds, because we just agree on everything. I got one. I didn't tell you about it. <laughs> oh, you bring it up later? Yeah, I'll bring it up later. You'll bring it up later? The time where you use your Jedi mind tricks on me? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> For those of you that aren't, uh, for those of you that aren't uh, viewing us, but just simply listening, I have on a uh, floral shirt, and Ian uh, asked me before the uh, we were about to hit record. He goes, "You want to comb your hair? <laughs> you want to change your shirt?" <laughs> we still got time. Still got time. I can always hit pause on this record. Well, I can so, go back. To, I can go back to the wife beater I'm wearing underneath this thing. So the the title of this episode is how to change anyone's mind. Um, and I think most of this episode, we're probably going to focus on managing up uh, because it's a little bit easier to change someone's mind who reports to you. You have power, you have authority. You can, at some point, you can get frustrated and say, just do it the way I said it. And, um, you know, I wouldn't, I don't think either of us would recommend to get to that point. But the truth is when you're the boss, at some point, your, your way does stick. I think we're talking a little bit more today about folks where we don't have any direct authority over. So bosses, executives, maybe customers. Outside customers, right. You know, uh, maybe just other stubborn people in our lives. Um, but what got, what got Frank and I talking about this, there's kind of a myth about Steve Jobs when you read enough about Jobs. And, um, you know, we, we both read Isaacson's book and we've, we've read plenty on him. But the, the myth about Jobs is that he just has these flashbulb moments all the time that comes up with these amazing innovations. And he convinces his team that this is exactly what we have to do. And through, you know, his sheer force of will uh, is persuasive enough to get his whole team to buy in and go invent things. And the truth really underneath that is that there are times where he is ahead of everyone else, but most of the innovations at Apple started with his engineers and they started with his engineers convincing him to go completely different routes than the company was going at the time. So case in point, for years, Jobs vowed never to make a phone. He, there's an infamous list that he built. He built a, like a top 20 list of, of reasons why we'll never build a phone. And his, his mindset with the phone was that that's for the pocket protector crowd. That's for nerds. That's for you know, smartphones are not impressive. He, he banned apps initially from outside developers when he did create the iPhone. He wanted a very closed system. We'll build every app. And obviously that was a miraculously stupid idea. You know, in, in the app store has become one of the main reasons why people won't get rid of an iPhone. He pledged, you know, he hated Bill Gates so much that he pledged that Microsoft software would never run on a Mac. And obviously that was not a great idea that was customer friendly. Um, you know, the TV business he said he would never get into, just hundreds of ideas that he vowed we would never do at Apple that people convinced him to do things differently. Um, and so a big part of this episode is looking into those stories, um, you know, at Apple and, and how he was convinced to do things different. Because obviously if you can, if you can convince Steve Jobs to do something different, he's about one of the most legendarily stubborn CEOs of all time, you should probably be able to convince just about any manager of anything. So as we are preparing for this and in communications, just kind of thinking through it, 
there's a, there's a couple of like top level takeaways that I immediately think of. Um, and some of them are this, some of this feels bureaucratic. I run a smaller business. So I feel like a lot of the bureaucracy that we're talking about with convincing stubborn people and the examples that we're going to talk about is in a lot of ways, a, a part of a bloated, big red tape, bureaucratic place. Now, Apple, a lot of egos, we're talking about like the second coming of jobs. Like it was already a publicly traded company. This is like way past the Wozniak garage days. Like this is a bigger organization that we're going to be talking about. A lot of our examples are from that. So let's just say you're listening to this and you're in middle management with a publicly traded company, or you're all the way on the other side of it. And you're me, you run a small business. You have people that work you, you work at a small business with, you know, someone like me in the, in the corner office. So the thing, the thing to think about is these are human tendencies. Everyone has them, struggles with them, deals with them. And they're real in every facet of life. I struggled in preparing for this episode and coming up with a lot of relevant examples that are current because I don't deal with a lot of people who are stubborn or hard nosed or these things, but it dawned on me that maybe I'm that person to other people. So in thinking through this, you have to realize what side of the fence are you on? You're frustrating somebody, no matter what you're doing. So you have to be mindful of it. And if you use the lessons that we're going to talk about with jobs and, you know, just our examples, and you think of it as, okay, people feel this way about me, it could potentially open you up to be a better leader, a better manager, um, run a more diverse business, um, to innovate quicker than some of your competitors, because you're just stubborn and stuck in the mud with certain things. So I think there's a lot of this, and I think it's going to be a fun topic to debate because of all of those factors. So it, it could be some, you know, swinging with a, with a manager or you're, you're the one who, who needs to take the punches. I think Frank has, I, I think Frank, you have higher emotional intelligence than the average bear, but I would tell you that right now, Frank and I are doing something with his management team where um, we get together weekly and we talk about different topics. And um, I think when you're the boss, you, it's easy for you to say, well, I'm a small company. We don't have that. Well, let me go, let me go pulse the 29 people that report to you and see if they feel like they don't have any of that to worry about. The truth is that on a weekly basis, man, we come up with two or three things where people start grinning. And I say, do we want to start sharing? Cause the elephants in the room, he'll take it. And you're great at taking it, but it's, uh, you know, this on every weekly call, they're like, all right, Frank, we got to tell you something. And so I, I think you understand it, but I would say, I don't think I think we're going to use jobs because he's famous and there's some cool examples. Um, I, I think this stuff all applies to small startups. I was just in Atlanta yesterday with a group of engineers who are all really intelligent. We are, they're all adding in their own ways, but we all have different opinions of what this product is going to look like, this tech product, and it's an invention. And people have different, very strong views on uh, components that we use or, um, just the way the system should operate in general, the specs. Um, and, you know, we have a startup owner who it's his baby that he's been my friend for 25 years. And there are times where he stubbornly hangs to something and I have to convince him differently. Um, and he, there are things that I'm stuck on that he is having trouble getting me to look at differently. So I would say, I, I think everything on this agenda, actually, when I was putting this agenda together, I thought about big companies, but I, my most recent experience with all of this was yesterday with a tech startup with less than 10 employees. Awesome. And I, so I think, so I think no matter where you are, there should be something you can glean from this, relate to, hopefully take back and, you know, implement. That's the whole reason we do this. So um, let's go. So the first, I think one of the first topics, it's, uh, it's good to start with the, uh, study. So Yale had a study where they asked students to rate um, their knowledge, their particular knowledge about how everyday objects work, uh, televisions, radios, things of that nature. Um, and this group of students rated themselves incredibly high in all of these different items. And then the researchers, what they went out and did was they asked these kids to go write out step-by-step -step explanations 
as if they were telling someone who had never seen these products before how they worked. And they struggled with that exercise. They really struggled to be able to kind of articulate um, what was going on. And, and then after the exercise, they went back and they asked them to re-rate their knowledge. And obviously the scores came way low and all of that was just by a simple exercise of asking them to explain how something works. So one of the first things we're gonna talk about, if you're struggling to get someone a high intelligence, high ego personality to explain how something works, it's much easier to then convince them, you know, how, how to change something because they can't always articulate, even though they might have a strong opinion, they can't always articulate how it works in the first place. So the example we're going to use, and all of these, we're going to use a jobs example. The example we're going to use is when the, when the iPhone, um, when they were first in development mode, prototyping, um, all of the Apple engineers were frustrated with the glass they were getting from Corning because it scratched very easily. The, anyone who had an initial iPhone would know this. They, they scratched really easy. And um, Jobs called this kind of a famous conversation he had with the CEO of Corning. His name was Weeks. Um, and you know, told him, my team is disappointed in your glass. You don't know what you're doing. And Weeks kind of calmly said, okay, if, if your folks have some knowledge and competency that we don't have, we'd love to meet with them and hear what their views are on how to make it. And Jobs kind of blustered back, I'm technical enough to explain it to your people. And so Weeks flew to Cupertino uh, with some of his folks to hear it out. And in that meeting, what Weeks did was he gave him a, a, a marker and he said, okay, here's a whiteboard. Explain to me, you know, the process of building scratch proof glass. I would love it. And it quickly, you know, became clear that Jobs had no idea how glass worked or how it was manufactured. And Weeks asked, can I show you the science behind this? Do, do, do you mind if I show some of my competency here? Can I show you the science? So he started getting into molecules and sodium, potassium, a bunch of stuff that Frank and I know nothing about. And after that meeting, Jobs realized, okay, you, you are the experts. And he gave them full control to go design the glass their way. And the rest is history. They, Corning came up with scratch-proof glass. And when the iPhone launched, Jobs sent him a note. And that, that weeks, he still has that you know, framed of, we couldn't have done this without you. Which I think we've all been in that situation where you're kind of banging your head up against the wall with someone who is stubborn or we've been the ones who've been stubborn. Um, and Ian, why don't you tell the example about what you dealt with when you moved to NVR, talk that through and then I'll, I'll close this section with a funny story. So my, um, my president was the founder of the company and he, he'd been with the company for 30 some years. Um, great, great guy, but really disconnected from what everything looked like. Um, so he would on a regular basis rail about the sales force. I don't know what the hell they're doing. You know, they're, why, are these, why are these applications taking so long? Why can't we get people locked earlier? Why are we, and he would say things that would really date him. He would say things where you would hear it and be like, wait a second, we haven't done that. And, you know, he, he'd bring up like using these uh, APR calculators, which no one had APR calculators in any branch. Like no one even knew what they were when I would ask about them because our software had been calculating it for a decade, right? And you'd be like, well, and they used their APR calculator. And, and you'd be like, what? and, and I, I I didn't know any better. So I would have to go ask my team because I was new to the industry. And I'd be like, do we have APR calculators? And people would laugh at me like, what is that? And I'd be like, oh shit. All right, like, someone needs to tell him that. But instead of saying you're disconnected in front of a group of people, which you know who I'm talking about, he would have lost his mind, right? He would have bombasted. Yeah. Um, I said, hey, you know, would you like, I'm going to go sit in on a loan application next week. And it's going to be local. It's, it's really close to here. Do you want to come to it with me? And um, he said no the first time. And then I came back and I'm like, man, I learned so much stuff. Did you know? And I purposely said something I knew he didn't know. And I said, you should really come sit in one of these. It was fun for me to really learn what these guys are going through. And I convinced him 
to come to you know, an appointment, a sales appointment that he had not, literally not been in one in two decades. Um, and it really opened his eyes to a lot of bullshit we were putting people through and how you know, the appointments took two hours and a lot of it was our making. We had all these extra um, you know, checklists. We had all these extra things that we were making people do. And it really opened his eyes. And he said, Ian, you got to make that shorter. You got to make this shorter for customers that I barely, and this is a guy, the best part about this, he's a guy with no patience. Like he would get up and leave a, a restaurant after 25 minutes if the check hadn't come and be like, pay the check, I'll get you later. Like he could not stay somewhere. He, he had time frame, So he, he thought this meeting would be in and out in 30 minutes and it took two hours and he couldn't get out of it because how do you tell the customer I'm leaving? And he's like, that's awful. you got to cut that. And before that, he had no interest in doing anything to change. And cutting it wasn't just, hey, salesperson, go faster, Frank. It was, we got to take this. Uh, we got to take this uh, form out that's no longer required by the government. We got to take this checklist down. We do the whole pro audit the process and chop it. We do all Things of it. And we did it. some of that. We right. did a lot of that where we cut that appointment in half. But he only did it after I convinced him to go sit in on something he hadn't watched in forever. So I had a famous meeting with this guy and I was a new manager and we were really struggling with something. And um, Ian and I were just becoming friends. And this guy was legendary. Like, I don't have a lot of exposure to this guy. He like blew up at a sales group that we were in like a couple years earlier. Like just like this guy was intimidating as hell. And I was going to be the sacrificial lamb. I was going to like lead with a couple of examples about someone who he'd kind of picked as one of his sacred cows from years earlier. And I had to use a couple of examples. And then we were going to use a senior leader who was way more respected than me to kind of drive the point home. And as we started to get into this, he knew he could challenge my authority. I was a young manager in this room. All I remember is he kept screaming the word attache. <laughs> are you saying he didn't take that out of his attache? And we were all looking at each other. We're like, what the hell is an attache? It's basically like a precursor of a, um, a briefcase. Um, but it was just, it was, hyster it was hysterical. So we've documented this incredibly well, right? And there's two sides of this. In a lot of instances with business or partnerships or with things that are of larger scale, Ego comes along with success and smarts and, and, and um, privilege. It, it just does. Like, like if you get to a certain, if, if you make you know, high six figures, seven figures a year, you earn it by being good. But also there's ego that comes with it. So there's two different things to kind of unpack here that I think is really interesting. I'm working on a real estate deal in Florida. Um, long story, but like I got, got brought into this deal and a person who's in the deal with me is significantly senior to me in age. He's someone I've always looked up to. And when I talk to him, I kind of microwave details and he's like, no, 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 slow down. And I feel like there's like a rub back and forth. And I learned in a very humble way that I'm better at this than he is. But in my head, there's absolutely no possible way that this guy isn't superior to me. This guy's made all of his money through restaurants and real estate deals, but he's not a technician with real estate the way that I am. And because of that, we would, we would rub heads. And I was coming from a place of deferential. I did not want to step on this guy's toes or over talk him because I have such a level of respect for him. And I just assumed he knew it. And like this happened a couple of weeks ago and I was just like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Let me go backwards and I'll come forwards and I'll explain it. And he goes, oh, perfect. Great. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I just assumed like I was wasting your time by going through the details. He's like, no, I need the details. So that takes me to a deal that Ian and I did. Ian and I are getting into a deal and he's stuck on something that is so fundamental for me. And I have left our, you know, shared world of Ryan Holmes, NVR, and I've been doing this for 10, 12 years. And to me, something that is just absolutely part of my every day was tripping him up. But I have a high level of respect for Ian. And I couldn't understand there's any way in hell 
that Ian didn't get this. Like it didn't make any sense to me because I had forgotten that I didn't know this at one point in my life. So I said, okay, let's unpack this deal. Let's go back through it. And Ian did all the math and the math was upside down. And there was like a $2 million deficit. I'm like, no, 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 no. Okay, I got it. So like I started to ask questions and the way that Ian was calculating a wholesale fee, we were double doing the math and because of it, it caused there to be an issue. But what happened for me is like Ian and I both have egos, but it was less about ego and more about just, just miscommunicating. But what we did is I made him explain it to me. Yep. I took notes and then I, as the subject matter expert go, boom, that's our problem. You and I said, Look, writing. You said, I want you to calculate the numbers that yeah. you think they are your investors, the debt, the equity, what we're paying for everything. I want you to just calculate everything. And I was missing something and it was, it was on the fee. Uh, yep. And, and you, you were like, you looked at it and you called me right away. You're like, I know why you're frustrated. Yep. I, I haven't explained this. Let me explain it a little bit better. I, I hadn't thought through it. And that, that actually really helped me because by making, I thought I understood the deal and I didn't like it. But when I went to explain it to you, I didn't understand the deal. And, and, and it was one of those things where neither of us has job size ego, but we both know when we read something, we're pretty convinced. I know what I'm doing. And it's, it's hard for us to admit that we don't know something. It's just not kind of where we find ourselves in a default. So kind of by mistake, by talking this through with you and just kind of by chance, it called out the same thing with jobs with the glass. It made it so, oh, I get it. I and then we talked through it. This. I think it's worth staying on this because at that point in the deal, I was kind of take it or leave this deal. I, I, you know, I, I had a lot of other things going on. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. I, I certainly wasn't convinced of calling all my friends and getting into something that I wasn't completely bought into yet. Um, but I think the way you handled me was, was right on that. If you would have called and said, dumbass, you don't you like you've never you've never seen uh you've never seen this kind of a fee on a deal structure like if you would have taken that approach to me i would have just been like dude go find someone else to do this i just wouldn't have been in the mood but you i think you handled my ego well in that and then you were like this is on me you would have never seen something like this in the real estate business and it doesn't really happen in commercial i learned and then you told me a story about how the first time someone proposed it to you you asked if it was legal you're like, actually, the first time someone ever proposed this, I, I had to call a lawyer and say, is this legal? What's going on here? Remember, you kind of told me that story. So I do. Of, it was kind of the just like me. You're like, oh, first time I saw it, I didn't get it either. Right. And then once you explained that to me, it was like, okay, I'm not the only asshole that doesn't know this terminology in the world. Because I, at that point, I could have easily just said, ah, I don't understand it all. I'm out, you know, not for me. So I think, I, I think the takeaway with this segment is this. If you're dealing with someone with like a job size ego, he's going to think he knows more about glass manufacturing than a glass manufacturer. But with normal human beings, we all have egos. With a normal human being, it's probably a misunderstanding. And you're not going to have to fight for control of the frame. But the thing to do, the same thing he did with the glass. It, okay, we're at a disconnect. Can you please explain to me the way that you understand this? And what if you're the expert on the subject and the person's explaining it back to you, you're going to see, oh, those things don't connect. Now I can solve the problem. Yeah. But you're, you're getting involvement. You're getting that person to tell you. You're honoring the fact that you value their opinion and you're getting them to talk. And by having all those things happen, then you say, oh, now I can, okay. I think I understand the problem. Can we talk this through? That is a repeatable method of problem solving. And it's, it's, it's a common problem. You bump heads with people. I mean, I can tell you tons of examples of this it, it happening. The last, the last piece I'll say in this, Frank, because we did talk about this from a sales perspective. If you're running into someone who has said definitively, no, I do not want to purchase. I don't want to do this. Now you're not only dealing with the rational side of they've done the, the calculus and it doesn't work for them. They don't want to buy. You're also dealing with their ego of having to go back on their word, which is really powerful for people. Yep. One way that I like to get over that is I like to call with new information. And I, Perfect. Call, right. I call by being self-deprecating myself. So I'll call and I'll say, I, I screwed up. I, 
I, you didn't have all the information to make a good decision here. I should have provided you this bit of information and I didn't. I want to share this with you because I think it, I think if I were you, I not knowing that information, I might have said no, but I think this is information you'd like to have. So now they don't have to go back on their word. Now they're not re now they're not changing their mind because no one likes to be seen as wishy-washy. Now I'm making a new decision. So if they were on the fence and you can give them new information, whether it's someone in your company or a customer, now you've saved their ego. So now they're not going back on a decision. They're saying, oh, well, that does change things. Now I'm making a new decision, not going back on an old one. We, we've talked about this before, but there's a bunch of ways to articulate this, but the way that I think I'm going to articulate it is like this. Um, you need to know where you want to get. So the glass manufacturer with jobs probably understood I can solve this problem. It's going to make the product incredible. I've got a stubborn world-class asshole on my hands that I have to deal with. And he was very, very, he, he handled himself in a way that didn't escalate the situation. When I was talking to Ian, I wanted this deal to get done. I wanted to do the deal with Ian. I could have been a dick, but it wouldn't have got me anywhere. What I needed to do at that moment was just be egoless and just talk and listen. And what you find, I manage a sales team. I manage people who manage a sales team. We deal with this all the time. The Ian's point of presenting new information and apologizing and not making people retread on sacred ground is important. And that's how you frame things in a way that I want to get this deal done. Let me think of how I do it. I'll, I'll, I'll end it with this. A two-year-old doesn't really have an ego, but they're very, very, they're very certain-minded. I'm struggling with my two-year-old to do a bunch of stuff. We have a lady that helps us in the afternoons and she walked over to Max and goes, Hey Max, is this water hot or cold? The goal was to get him to wash his hands. She asked an incredible question about the temperature of the water and he got his little ladder and he stuck his hands in and boom, he's washing his hands. Like that is how you can, it's it just awesome stuff. It's just a little bit of a shift. That's next level ninja trick with kids. Oh, I thought it was awesome. Last night I'm like, instead of saying, hey, do we think you can go take a shower now? I was like, do you think we can make your hair into a mohawk? And he, I showed him pictures on my phone. It was awesome. Got me thinking about all kinds of stuff. Like, hey, is this carrot hot or cold? Like, can you try it? What is That's it? That's it. That's it. Um, so the the second thing uh, that we want to talk about uh, is, um, and, and I'll start with, I'll start with another job story. So late 90s engineer at Apple is frustrated having to lug his Mac back and forth from uh, different rooms because he wanted to listen to music in different rooms and he only had one computer. And so he came up with the idea of a streaming box. So an additional box. Be before streaming. you get too far into this, I have to just say something. These are like Apple employees. I had no idea how to play music through my computer in the 90s. Like no clue. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Um, yeah. So this guy was way next level on us. Um, so he came, came up with an idea of how to stream, how to stream that audio, have one kind of central brain, which to all of us, it's the cloud now. This is simple. This is just right. how we live. Um, but Jobs, in typical Jobs fashion, uh, came back to him and said, who the fuck would ever want to stream audio and video? And the engineer knew enough to just leave it alone. That's kind of the way Jobs would react to things. He thought it was dumb. Um, but he came back to him another time and he had some new ideas. And he asked Jobs, what if you could see everything on your computer on a TV in the basement through just a little small device? How would you go about thinking about the technology of that idea? And, and Jobs is, has an engineering mind and a design mind, so it got him thinking. And nothing came of it, but the next time this engineer saw Jobs, he had a whole bunch of thoughts. It, he had planted it a couple of times, and it got to the place where Jobs started bringing it up so much that he was taking ownership. And the engineer was fine with Jobs all of a sudden saying, I have this idea. Um, but what ended up coming out of it was the Apple TV. And Jobs gave him a whole bunch of resources, go build a team, build me the Apple TV. Um, and again, what this engineer did was he gave up control by asking, you know, what if you could see it? What if you could do it? And there's, there's, a, study, um, there's a study that was done on Hollywood screenwriters. Um, and those, those whose pitches 
won versus those whose pitches lost. And what they found was those screenwriters who came and pitched a fully formed concept out of the gate, right? Everything is rigid, tight. This is exactly the way it's going to look. They struggled to gain traction with, you know, high ego executives in the Hollywood, Hollywood world. Um, but the successful ones, they treated the pitch more like an opening argument, an opening stance. So it was kind of incomplete. It wasn't full. And they started with, here's some of the ideas. And I would love to hear some of your thoughts on how we might finish this off. Those were the ideas that won because they brought the ego in and they gave control to the decision maker rather than saying, here's, here's a wrapped up package, take it or leave it. I had something else written down, but I want to talk about it this way. I've used this example on the podcast before, but it's the best example for me in my life. I had an interview with someone with a big ego and a stubborn person. And in the interview, I basically just allowed the person to kind of finish off the questions. Like he would ask me a question and I would ask, you know, this, 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 and this is my answer. What do you think? And that person would talk and talk and talk. And what ended up happening is I got a huge promotion. I was told, you know, through ways I shouldn't have known that I was like the best interview he's ever had in that role. And what I did is I just manipulated the situation because it was someone who was very stuck in the ways that they thought. And I put the conversation back into their mouth and allowed them to take it out. Um, it works. This really, really, really does work. Now, I own a business. My money's on the line. What happens in a lot of instances, like if people want me to do things, they drag me out to a meeting. Come walk this with us. If I don't initially see it, come walk this with us. Come look at it. What do you think of it? Hey, we should get in the car. Like there's a new market. I'm a little skeptical. Let's go get, I'll take you down there. I know a restaurant. Those are the things that people in my office do to me because I, I don't want to lose money. I don't, I don't necessarily want to try that. It's kind of out of the realm. So they'll show me, Hey, I'm going to demo this new piece of software for you. Uh, I really would love you to look at it. Those are the ways that people can nudge me along to do something else. It, 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 like these are repetitive patterns. Our wives probably do it to us. We talked about doing it to our kids. Like these are th like this stuff works, but that's how you can get someone who's kind of like in their way to move forward. You know, um, it, an approach that I used often when I really, when I wanted to get something done that I, that I knew was going to create a little bit of friction, um, you know, and this is in dealing with, you know, uh, people that are kind of stuck in their ways of doing things. So CEOs, presidents, high level executives, um, I, I would have my thoughts that I, of something I wanted to change. And I would, you know, casually in a conversation say, Hey, look, I'm forming some thoughts around an approach I want to take on something that's not working in our business right now. Um, but I'm having trouble finishing it. Can I, can I get an hour of your time to present what I've come up with so far? And maybe your experience can help me fill in the dots. I've, I've, first off, I've never had anyone at any level say no to that. It plays to an ego unbelievably, right? And, and nor have I ever said no to anyone who's tried that approach with me, right? I was thinking I've never that, said no. I was I've thinking this. Like, well, maybe my expertise could help you, you know, I'm sure it could. Hey, we're having this meeting. It's this, this, and this is going to happen. We really love your insight for the end of it. Do you think you can come? I, you never, I'll let me move my schedule. The, the I'm, so if you're listening to this and you want to try this, the I'm stuck part is okay. very important. So you're saying, I can't do this without you. I'm stuck. But what it assumes is your boss is already on board with whatever changes you're about to do. He just needs to sign it. That's what I was trying to get. And, and really what I would do, I wouldn't even come with an incomplete process. I would come with a whole proposal of what we should do to change something in the business, but I would frame it in a way that they were going to stamp it and I needed them to finish it off when I really probably didn't, but they would tweak some things, change some things, but nine times out of 10, I would get everything I wanted. And they, and then I could say, you know, Hey, this was, this was Bill's idea. You know, he came up with this and I would give him all the credit, but really I was getting what I wanted. And he felt 
in control. So I gave up that control of this isn't Ian's idea. This is going to be yours by the time we're done talking because I'm not good enough to finish it. I need you to put that final concept and thoughts into it. And it works. It works when you give up control to a stubborn person. In, in stated another way, it's an assumptive close. You're basically, it, it's, an, it's an assumptive close. You're, you're presenting the whole thing. What do you think? And, you know, change this and this, but you've taken something that was concept, you've laid it out, you've sold it. You said, you didn't ask about, you know, how do I connect B to C, C to D, E to F? You're like, how does X, Y, and Z come together? And by doing that, you're kind of taking the, the stance of we've all agreed that you know the first 23 alphabets of the letter are good like so it's it, it's 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 a really it, it's a very strong close yep so uh there's this has been floating around on youtube forever you can go find it if you want jobs shortly after coming back to apple this is 97 he was a keynote speaker at a tech conference and he's up on a stage getting interviewed and they come to the q a portion and some dude gets the microphone and he leads with, Mr. Jobs, you're a bright and influential man. And you know, Jobs doesn't let him get any farther. He kind of quips in and says, here it comes. You know, Because whenever someone says something like that, you're kind of ready for the butt. Uh, right. so, so this guy goes on to light him on fire. He's kind of like, it's sad and clear that on many accounts, you don't know what you're talking about. And um, when I watched this video the first time, you're just ready for Jobs to light him up because you know Jobs had that temper and he was bombastic and could yell and scream. And so the audience kind of expected it, but Jobs didn't fight him. He said, you know, I readily admit that on many things in life, I don't have the faintest idea what I'm talking about. So I apologize. We'll find the mistakes and we'll fix them. And the crowd went nuts um, because it was such a humble approach. Um, but I, I've always seen that video and, and looked at it. And, um, and thought, I wonder how that would have went if he hadn't have started with the, 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 the compliment, the you're a bright and influential man. So he concedes to his ego first, but then goes into what he really wants to say. I've always thought, would Jobs have handled it the same way if he wouldn't have led with a softer approach? It's the perfect volley. It's a smart, smart way to attack someone who is clearly richer and probably more talented and successful than you since you're in the audience and that person's on the stage. So it's, it, it's, it, it smacks a humility and awareness and um, it, it gives, it sets it off the right way. And what I, what I immediately think of with this is where have I handled situations like this similarly and well, and where have I not handled it well? And what was it? Is it frame of mind? Is it how someone brought it to me? Is it, where was it? So maybe it was the perfect storm of things just worked great, but maybe it was part of the delivery. But those are the things that you kind of start to look at is like, okay, this one worked. This was the, this was the right volley over the net and he did it great. And it, and it, and it worked out to be tremendous from both, from both accounts. So the, you know, uh, psychologists have studied narcissists and, um, you know, we're, we all have different identities. We all have different, you know, I'm, I might be the most confident guy in the realm of sales and not terribly confident when it comes to finance or something else. And uh, we all kind of feel different in secure in some areas and insecure in other areas. And so what psychologists have found is that um, a narcissist, if you can lead with bolstering them in an area where they already feel secure, they are more open to feedback and less aggressive. So one, one famous study, psychologists, um, they, they split narcissists into two groups. And one group uh, would approach them by leading off, reminding them that they are athletic or funny, and the other didn't do anything. And they found that narcissists were way less aggressive if you led with a little bit of honey, if you led with a little bit of praise in an area where they already felt that way, they were open to feedback um, somewhere else. So, you know, to me, it's if you're dealing with a narcissist, leading with a little bit of praise, I, I, I worked for a president who was very good with process, very good with finance. 
I didn't find him terribly great with people or sales. Um, so I would lead a lot of conversations with, look, I don't have your skills and process mindset or, or finance, um, but, and then I would pivot, but there's, there's, the truth is the sales team is losing confidence in some of the things that we're doing. So rather than just leading with the sales team is not confident in you as a leader, which was the truth, I would lead with a lot of the things that you've done have impressed the sales team in the field and they appreciate it, but they're losing confidence in us as a leadership team and understanding what they're going through. I still got to say what I wanted, but I led by saying, here's the things you've done well in your competencies and then subtly reminded him, you don't really know sales well, and you certainly don't know people in sales. The mistake you see with this is people who don't do this well, compliment the person on the same thing they're trying to correct. Mm. So yeah. you'll, you'll see like, hey, you really help the sales team. It's really hard to then say, well, you can't relate to the sales team. And I've seen this a lot. Like I, I work in a, you know, an outside organization and we had someone that was on our, our, our leadership team for a while and we'd always compliment him on leadership and, but his leadership sucked. It was like <laughs> his concepts were good. His thoughts were good, but he really wasn't a good leader. He wasn't doing any of the nuts and bolts stuff you needed to do. So it was really hard to tear him down because you were building him up in the same lane. So what you really want to say is you're a very strategic, you've got good strategic ideas. Your follow through sucks. Your right. execution is not good. But when you compliment him on leadership, he would, you know, now he's bolstered to be like, well, what do you mean? You, I, I you, you, you couldn't. And part of the argument that I had was like, we have to separate these things into different categories. We need to categorically say you're really strong here, but your weaknesses here are bringing down those strengths. Instead of bolstering them, they're eroding them. But that's what you see in a lot of instances with people that aren't tactical or skilled managers in giving feedback is sometimes you're inadvertently giving someone more encouragement when you don't want to do that. But the way that you did it, Ian, you're like, you're really strong on these three things, which is very much away from the areas where you needed the help. And if you, if, so you have to have some strategy in how you deliver this. So uh, another approach is just if someone is really dug in, so it's, it's pretty famous that Jobs hated Bill Gates. He hated Microsoft and for a long time. Microsoft software will never be on any of our devices, period. Um, and if you were trying to argue with him about that in 1985, you weren't getting anywhere. You, it was just a non-starter. It was a waste of time, even though a lot of the engineers knew this is pretty stupid. Microsoft is, it owns the world and most people know that software. Um, but I think there's gotta be times where you just choose not to try to persuade someone and let the consequences of their decision show them. So Max failed to gain traction with market share forever with Safari and their own iOS. Um, and they really made a lot more traction when they started allowing you to download Microsoft software so people could have a nicer, sleeker, more beautiful device, but use software they were more inherently uh, comfortable with. Because and familiar they with. Yeah, they used it at work. So, you know, I think there have been many times where I have known without a shadow of a doubt that an executive was going down a path that was going to lead to major ramifications that would hurt. And I made my argument in multiple ways, but I could just sense they're dug in. And in those cases, you have to be a good soldier and say, okay, I'm gonna try it as hard as I can your way. You know, I've had my disagreement, but don't think when I leave this office, I'm not on board with you. I'm gonna go try it your way as hard as I can. And there's just times where you need to let Rome burn a little bit for that person then come to you and say, God, it's not working, is it? And they'll, they'll come back and they're not gonna, they're not always gonna come to you and say, I was wrong. In fact, most of the time they won't. What they'll do is they'll say, how can we tweak this? How can we modify it? How can we change it? They'll make small changes to their initial, you know, dug in approach, but that's okay. And sometimes you just need to let it burn a little bit and let them see the consequences of their decisions. So, in a small business, 
I think there's things you can allow this strategy to, to, to manifest, to take shape. And there's some things you can't. So what I, what I'm driving at with this is like, I've had people that were an admin or on the sales side and they were dug in and it's going to cost us hundreds, if not a couple thousand, maybe tens of thousands of dollars, but it was kind of capped. But then I've had people in, in larger roles who were dug in and were certain that something was right. And it was bankrupting us. It was causing us to not be fiscally responsible as a business. And, or they weren't converting in certain ways or that like something got outside of yeah. the, the parameters with which they could make risk. And I had to just fire them like, like the high level people inside of the business that just fundamentally were disconnected from what I thought we needed to do. And, and I had someone who worked here that was at a very high level and like, we just could not get linked. And I let it go a couple of times, but I couldn't let it burn anymore because it would have burned us down. And so, so you have to understand, like, if you're the one doing the burning, you need to make sure it's, 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 you know, you're, you're pruning the outer part of the forest to make the, 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 the inside stronger and, and, not, and you're not burning down the core. And, and, and as the leader, you need to understand that stuff and you need to say, nope, this has got to go. So I, um, when I first started, um, right after I developed my first leadership program, Leadership Essentials, um, I hired a marketing firm to help me out. And um, I, we were having a conversation and I kind of knew what I wanted my marketing campaign to look like. And um, he's an expert. This guy has a hundred companies that his team works for. And all they do is digital marketing campaign, social media stuff. And I have a presence on LinkedIn. And so I said, look, I want this ad campaign to be on LinkedIn. And he said, he said, okay, I understand that you're on LinkedIn. Um, I, I tend to start with Facebook because their algorithm is a little stronger. It kicks in a little faster. You get better feedback and it's much less expensive on all of the different metrics per click, per, per view, per impression, all those different things. And I, knowing nothing about social media, knowing nothing about digital marketing, of course, I disagreed with him and said, nope, we're doing LinkedIn. And uh, of course, because I'm such an expert, right? I just got a Facebook account two years ago. I, why wouldn't I be an expert in social media? So he said, okay, you're the boss, right? You're paying me one way or another, we'll run the campaigns. And we ran it for months and it didn't do shit. It was terrible. And uh, one of our weekly calls, uh, he got on and he said, um, how long do we want to do this? You know, did, uh, I'll do it as long as you want. But it was kind of a like, you know, he, he summarized it all. He showed me we're getting no sales. We're getting, you know, this isn't working. It's expensive the way we're doing it. Can we try it a different way? Um, but what was great was he didn't just dig his heels in and say, I'm the expert. You're paying me. I disagree with you. He let me feel it in my wallet because I was paying money and getting nothing in return. And the first month, Frank, that we turned down our Facebook ads, we got three $1,000 programs for leadership essentials. And he didn't gloat. We, we just got on there. He's like, hey, great. We got a couple of sales. You know, he didn't gloat. He was really nice about it. Um, but the way he handled it was great. He let me go down a path that he knew was going to fail. And that's not to say LinkedIn's not going to work at some point. It wasn't the right time. He told me why it wasn't. I disagreed and he said, okay, you're the boss. And it cost me probably like 9,000 bucks, right? It was an expensive, ego-driven, stupid decision on my part to fight him over three months over it. Right, it, but what you learn in management is sometimes you gotta let people just do it. That, that, that's the thing. As the owner of a business, you have to pick and choose. I'm willing to let this person learn. I'm no longer willing to fund it. Like, like so it, 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 this is your own business. You came to your own conclusion smartly, but you know, you, you, you burned a little bit of money to get there, but that you can't just tell people things. You got to let them experience. It's kind of like your kids. You can't just sit there with a book and teach them how life is going to work. You got to put them out there in the field and let them test what you've taught them. And then, it, you know, then adjust. So the last thing we're going to talk about is just tenacity. 
Um, and you know, the, there's, there's no substitute. And we're, we're finishing with this because the truth is we're making this seem simple. It's never one discussion when you're trying to overcome something serious, when someone's made their mind up and you have to overcome it, it's sometimes dozens of conversations to get them to where you need to be. And um, a couple examples of this, in the 80s, the executives in the MAC team used to give out an annual award to the person who had the temerity to just challenge job most often. So who's the person that fights with Steve most often and comes, it didn't matter whether they came out ahead or not, who's most willing to raise their hand and argue with him in meetings because he could be such a bully. And what's fascinating about all that is he, and he eventually promoted all of the winners of that annual award to run their own division. So you might think, hey, arguing with the boss is a dumb idea, it's career limiting. The way Jobs saw it is even though he argued with them, he ended up respecting them um, a lot more than it did. And the other Apple story is Jobs just hated the idea of a phone. And, um, you know, he, he made his lists of reasons why he hated it. Um, and it took them months and years to get him just chipping away. What they would do is they would go run little secret prototypes they would go use like chunk, they would save budget in one area and go build a little prototype on their own time. They built demos, they created new designs and they would just put, leave it on his desk, get him thinking about it, propose things, leave little articles. The story of how they chipped away at his resistance on, on designing a phone is really fascinating, but it, it's dozens and dozens of little approaches, little conversations that finally got him turned around. Um, and there's, there's researchers did a big study on CEOs and who they nominated for board seats at other companies. And what they found was the candidates who had an, a habit of arguing before agreeing with the boss were much more likely to get the nod than the yes men and the yes women. Um, and I think most people would think that that's counter. And, and in, in my experience, at least, Frank, there are many many, many, many more yes men and yes women than those who just always seem to argue. Um, but I, personally, I've, they would drive me nuts in some meetings because sometimes I was just not in the mood to be challenged. I didn't feel like having my authority challenged in front of a group. Um, but over time, when I think about the people I promoted, they were the ones that weren't afraid to tell me I was terribly wrong. So uh, there's two things in there to unpack. I'm gonna start with the, um the board seats and the people who are argumentative, right? Um, I was raised by a school teacher, my mom, and um, I was under the impression for a large period of my time in my life that likable people are the ones that got good things to happen to them. Likable people are people, because my mom is a likable person. That's what she believes in. And um, what I learned is likability is part of it. But I'm a, I'm a contrarian. I mean, I'm not easy to get along with sometimes, but I know my shit. And if I'm arguing with you with something, it's because I've put in two decades of work and this is the thing I know the best and I don't think it's right. So I'll argue or I'll fight back and I can get away with it. The episode we did about humor, the guy that we talked about a lot was our, our friend Ken. The reason that Ken can get away with humor so much is because he was likable, but more than anything, he was competent. So if you're going to fight back and you're going to push, the people who do it are typically people who have a slightly different mindset. And if you look at U.S. history as an example, right, there's the book, which most, most of us didn't read because it was huge. But if you watch the series on John Adams, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had a lot of similarities, but they butted heads a lot. But the two of them were banging back and forth and forging metal each one of them with a different hammer. And it was a lot of fighting and a lot of turmoil, but ultimately they got where they needed to go. And our country got where it got because the two of them were fighting back and forth to come up with something that made sense. That's what gets you on a board seat. That, it, but it, it has a lot to do with competence and less to do with, with, with um, you know, the fact that you're gonna confront someone. I mean, anything meaningful that I've done in my career, anything that I'm proud of that I look back on that was big, um, almost never got sold on the first try. It was, yeah. it was 
back and over and over. I know you said, no, here's some more information. Let me approach this a different way. Hey, look, we've had some time since that last decision. Here's how things have gotten worse. Can we talk about it again? Is there a different approach we could take slightly from what I presented? How can I show you what I'm feeling? And it over and over and over, it's just rare that you sell something big on a, on a first try. Furthering that, like the Apple thing, right? He's promoted these people that were or the ones who had the best idea that was fought. There's a lot of people who had ideas that were fought that didn't get the best idea. And a lot of those people got fired. Like you're, you're, if you are going to be a pioneer, you're going to take arrows and sometimes you die because of it. So, but if you're passionate about what you're doing, you, I, I would think the people who won were persuasive, knew how to take shit up front, give a compliment, do use some of the skills that we talked about to really persuade, but the ones that didn't do it properly, didn't execute the skills the right way or at the right time or the right moments, those are the ones that ultimately took the arrows and perished. So you've got to think about those things and, and, and not getting through the, not getting through the barrier the first time Ian, to your point about selling something and it being rebuffed, not going full napalm, going full nuclear. Like you could have gone nuclear. You're an asshole. How do you not see this? Like that's going to get you shown out. Okay. I lost this round. I'm going to regroup. I'm going to come back. I'm going to re I'm going to, we always talk on this show about not having just one pitch. I'm going to use my curveball. I'm going to use my slider. I'm going to use my changeup. I'm going to do, I wasn't good enough to get through. It isn't you. It's me. Let me come back with a slightly different pitch. It's the same way that we talked about with the RVA deal. I took it as I haven't done my job explaining it. And once I did that, you saw the humility in it. And we did an incredible deal because we were both on the right footing. I think to wrap this up, if you're a leader, seek out people that are willing to try to change your mind, find them, promote them, pay them well. You, there is no Steve Jobs. There is no Apple as we know it if they were all his original ideas. Behind all those ideas were people convincing him to change his mind and get uncomfortable and step out of what his belief system was. So if you're a leader, find more people like this and cultivate them around you and try to try to get as many people disagreeing with you on, on a regular basis. If you're going a long period of time as a manager or a business owner without any disagreement whatsoever, there's a good chance you're going on the wrong path. You can't be in, you can't innovate. You can't grow without some failure, without swinging and missing. You just can't. And I, I, I think sometimes you ultimately, like in my, in, in my business, ultimately I'm responsible. If payroll is made or not is my, my, my responsibility. If we go bankrupt, if we don't pay a debt, ultimately it's my responsibility. So I have to make sure the ship doesn't sink. But along the way, we have to have the ability to take some shots and give people and give people a shot at taking chances and trying new things because of the fact that you can't you can't continually innovate if you don't try it. Love it. Love it. Hey, just a fantastic episode by you. I am not going to be disagreeable with you today. You should go comb your hair, though. I mean, it's there's you should do something about that. I'm told to your do. employees today. I mean, we're not at home. We're not in pajamas. Let's let's tighten up, bro. My barber tells me that unstructured on top is in the unstructured. I saw the picture of you and Max in the bathtub making mohawks, and it feels like you haven't combed it since. It's true. You know, you've, it's just, true. <laughs> you've just left it. <laughs> See you, Frankie. See you. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it.